Hello and welcome to episode 91, part 2 for Awesome Astronomy for January 2020. Feeling it yet? It's been over two weeks since you said you would. And let's face it, 15 days in you must be feeling it. The lack of meat, the lack of alcohol. By now your levels of self-righteousness, superiority and smugness must be peaking. <laughs> but don't worry, it won't last. As early as tomorrow, your resolve will begin to collapse and your newfound evangelism for oat milk, tofu burgers and coconut water will wane. Your bank balance will begin to once more breathe a sigh of relief and within a fortnight you have worked out how to retreat from your moral high ground and join everyone else in the sewer of self-loathing and bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of moral sewers, it must be time to introduce my co-host, that loose woman, Jenny. Why, hello there. <laughs> hey. And the ever corrupting Ralph. Hello. <laughs> oh, ding dong. <laughs> Have you seen that um, KFC is doing a vegan burger? They are everyone's. Every it, the the bandwagon is massive. And this I was year. in Subway today getting my lunch, and they've got a meatless meatball sub. Yeah, there's a vegan steak bake in um, yeah. in Greg's, isn't there? I will and... say the vegan sausage roll is pretty good. I was very impressed with it. Actually, do you know what? I've had a couple of those over the year. They've been pretty good, actually. Yeah, because like I've had some vegan stuff, and I've been like, "Oh no, no, this is this is bad. This is not good." Usually, vegan cheese is not great, but yeah, I was pretty impressed with Greg's vegan sausage roll. I'm definitely going to try yeah. the KFC vegan chicken burger. Going to give it a go. I wish I could be vegan. I quite like the idea of not killing animals, but. It's just they just taste so damn good, don't they? <laughs> We're gonna get letters. We are gonna get so many letters. <laughs> but you're right, bacon's amazing. I think veganism now is where vegetarianism was like 20 years ago when it was. Oh, oh yeah, very difficult. Yeah, you're right. Completely. Oh, do you know what? In 50 years' time, it's gonna be completely. I say yeah. normal, but it's gonna be the, the it'll be one of those big, quite majority things. Absolutely. This is that thing that we say, isn't it? This will be the thing that our kids and grandkids will say, God, I cannot believe that you guys ate meat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the same way that we look at our grandparents and think, they, they ate what? They ate tongue? And yes. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, tripe. And what the hell? Yeah. yeah what the hell? Like my, my father always talks about bread and dripping. And like, what? Oh, what? Yeah. You're trying to give yourself yeah. a heart attack by 11? What the hell are we using? How eating? are you still alive? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like, how, how do you live? <laughs> I just, I feel like sort of 20 years ago, restaurants, you, you're like, oh, vegetarian option. And then there would be one dish. Now you go to restaurants and there's like four or five vegetarian dishes. And, mm. I, and yeah. veganism now, there's like one vegan dish if you're yeah, lucky. Yeah, and then it'll be. But give yeah. it 20 years yeah. and it'll be so much easier and as it becomes easier more people will do it of course will yeah i'm still old-fashioned and i look at look down a menu and just ignore the vegetarian and vegan options whereas you know they've got so good that yeah it's, mm. uh, it's i know it's remiss of me to not even you know take a look and see whether it's something that's appealing i feel like they put more effort into vegetarian dishes because there's no meat in there mm. that because a yeah. lot of flavor mm. can come from meat and i feel mm. like they do put a lot more effort in in terms of herbs and spices and and things like that if it's a vegetarian dish mm. compared to a meat and dish. and welcome to cooking with awesome astronomy <laughs> um <laughs> can we get back to space yeah we should actually talk this is not like you know a, a food and drink podcast this is a space podcast <laughs> What I was going to say is that look, look, we're two weeks after New Year now, and surely, like we uh, we'll put the spoiler warning out. Spoilers, um, but Star Wars and Doctor Who. Right. Well, the problem is you're saying it's now two weeks after New Year's. We're not recording this two weeks after New Year's, and I haven't Shh. seen the Star Wars Shh. movie or Doctor Who, Shh. so I can't right. comment. Let look. Let's not ruin everything. Next, people won't believe that this is Nigella and the Hairy Bikers doing this show. <laughs> 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 oh, if I could cook like Angela, life would be sorted. <laughs> what did Star Wars? Those who've seen it, what do you think? Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Um, the way that J.J. Abrams was able to pull this back together with the, the, the prequels to episode nine that he didn't write and to be able mm. to weave it all back together and, and put everything kind of 
tie up all the loose ends and and give everybody what they want. I I just thought he did a magnificent job because um, when I was when I was watching it, I didn't think that there was too much in there. But looking back on it, there's so much there that's lots. thrown in, but he's done it so well mm. that it doesn't look like it's just you know throwing yeah. tripe in to to come back to tripe again. Um, I, I just thought it was brilliant, and um, I went yeah. to go and see it with my sister-in-law, um, uh, and we were both, at the end of it, we both had to confess that we were both crying, trying not to look like we were crying in front of each other. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I agree with a friend of mine, um, hello Rich, I know he listens, um, who who said, he, we, we'd both seen it on the same day, but at different times, and we, we sort of bumped into each other at the end of the day, and he said, it basically... It was great. It was a large portion of Monterey Jack. <laughs> there was a lot of cheese in there. There was. <laughs> but he didn't mind it. But it was good cheese, mm. and it was kind of necessary cheese, and the action sequences were awesome. They were. The fight on the old Death Star. Yeah. That was that was epic. Brilliant. That, Brilliant. That, was, that was one of the great fights in Star Wars. It was yeah. just epic. It was brilliant. Yeah. Um, and and it was full of stuff like that, and it was it was it was cheesy and silly and hammed up, and that's exactly what Star Wars should be. So it was yeah. great. Yeah, they did that thing of introducing new Jedi skills that um, that you think, yeah. you know, maybe rather than it just being a, a bit of a plot device, it'd be useful if you actually used this in certain other areas as well. You know, uh, you know, um, well, I, I don't that, I don't spoil that. anything, but no, uh, but it is that it's that old joke about Star Wars, isn't it? Especially like Rogue One, um, that. The, the scene in the end of Rogue One where Darth Vader goes absolutely mental. <sighs> One of the greatest scenes ever in Star Wars. Yeah, I know, exactly. It, That's just me- orgasmic. <laughs> oh, God, isn't it? Um, it makes the fight between the in New Hope <laughs> yes. between Darth Vader and Obi Wan or um, Alec Guinness. It look that's just ridiculous. Two old men talk, like poking each other. With a stick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> rather than uh, just going uh, uh, ninja Darth Vader on him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you, you look back at the prequels where you had Yoda doing all that kung fu shit in the air. Yeah. Um, and then you've got this, you know, Obi Wan and thing, just like basically almost avoiding hitting each other with with wooden sticks. It uh, <laughs> it it does kind of highlight how bit crappy that was yeah but oh god it was a good film it was a good I, I fe- it was really good i felt uplifted when i came out of it because i was i was all ready to go and go oh is it gonna be all right it's gonna it's, this, this is it this is this is the end yeah but, but, but it's it not good. the end no clearly because not because you've got the mandalorian that's on disney plus currently in america i think and soon to be in the uk there's mm-hmm. two so now who's the guy that did the last jedi um with the Irish sounding name. Um, anyway, the director of that is doing a new trilogy that will mm-hmm. be based on a whole different set of characters uh, from a galaxy far, far away. Um, and then there's going to be two spin offs an OB1 spin off, and I can't remember what the other one's going to be, but they're both going to be on Disney Plus. So there's a whole load of new stuff that Disney are doing in the Star Wars universe, but none of it will be with the Skywalker mm. and, um, and Anakin and. And all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's there's a rumor about Poe, isn't there? There's a rumor that they're oh, going to do something with the Poe character. Yeah, you didn't um, like him, but I did. I, I he warmed on me. He got mm. better and better. I thought I I thought he was a bit of an asshole at the beginning, but it, it, it's <laughs> the character warmed on me. Well, I, Laura I, Dern showed him how wrong he was, didn't she? Yeah, in exactly. The Last Jedi. She and her purple hair put him <laughs> in his place. It's not just Star Wars this Christmas. It's been Doctor Who. As well, Doctor Who is back after a big break, and mm. my goodness me, what a start what of the series! A starter that is. John's got his fingers in mm. his ears because he's not watched this. Yet, John, but we're John's not now going la 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 la. Yeah, yeah. no spoilers because I haven't seen it either. Oh, you're really missing out then, Jen. You've got to watch it. I watched Gavin and Stacey instead, and it was fab. In that say, in that case, I'm just going to say it was masterful. Yes, it really was. And I thought that this is getting close to being as good as it was under the Matt Smith and uh, David Tennant da- yeah, um, yeah, era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The best, so the I, best I thought of the those last eras. series, it was a bit of a shame when they'd introduced the first female Doctor that they made it, for me, I thought they made it a bit too childish and a bit silly. Now, this, like like you said, Paul, this, this is, it's actually got 
it is a bit silly, but it's the right level mm. of silliness. And yeah, um, it's got to be it's, it's Doctor Who. It's, it's got but it's got silly, more depth but... to it, and it's cleverer. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I really loved about the earlier series when you'd got a lot more depth, and you got the Bad Wolf stuff, and you got the recurring yeah. themes, and and the sound of the drums th- and everything that was like just layer and upon layer. Jodie Whittaker's really, really kind of found the character. I think now she's yeah. doing. It. She's she's really kind of cracked it which is often the case with with a an actor goes into doctor who it takes him a yeah. series to kind of get warmed up yeah, yeah. peter capaldi never it. really did it but jody has and yeah um, really good. She's, she's grown into those trousers so well that they don't even reach her mm. ankles <laughs> exactly 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 um actually do you know what i the comment i said like do you know what even bradley wolf seems to have acted a lot better this time yeah i thought he, he, he's got better and better it's, it's getting harder to dislike him isn't it <laughs> he, he was a big surprise pick, and I was I was all ready to, and actually he's he's warmed. I've warmed him. Yeah, yeah, but good. Um, you're off to New York. Oh, I am. Yes, uh, and this this came about just because um, I put out on Twitter that um, I was heading off to New York next year, and I, uh, next year next week, and I wanted some uh, thoughts on um, good places to visit that are off the tourist trail because I've not been to New hmm. York in. 11 years and last time I was there I spent about a month there and really went you know went tourist crazy and did all the stuff that that everyone should do and I wanted some kind of like niche places to go to and Mm. really get into the dirty underbelly of New York Um, and uh, it was our good friend Gavin Price that suggested going to the Cradle of Aviation Museum and because he um, added them on Twitter when he was suggesting that they got in touch and said that um, if I give them a time they'll try and set me up with a tour guide who worked on Apollo (gasps) at Grumman and um, and sort out an interview with their curator as well because, (gasps) get this it's one of three sites in the US that has um, the original lunar module um, because there was three that were built for Apollo 11, uh, sorry, Apollo 18, 19 and 20 that of course never flew because Apollo 17 was the last one that was cancelled after that Mm. so Dick Gordon uh, Dick Gordon who was a command module pilot on um, Apollo 12, um, the, the the best of the Apollo missions. His lunar module that never flew is uh, is in there. So uh, really looking forward to seeing that and oh. having a chat with um, the guy who worked on Apollo at Grumman because Grumman, of course, built the uh, lunar modules. Oh, my God. Superb. That is so exciting. Oh, looking forward to that. Well, there's, there's whetted everyone's appetite, hasn't it? Yeah, of course. Now, I've emailed them about this, giving them a time. And if they don't get back to me and it doesn't happen, I've whetted people's appetites. And this is gonna, we're just going to have to hush, hush, move on in the next shows and never mention this again. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no, no, everyone should email uh, the museum and be like, well, why didn't you speak to Osma Shonry? We're all really disappointed now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't blame yeah. us, blame them. Yeah, it, right blame then. them so on e- Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Evidence is there. So emails. Jenny, hit us with some emails. If you're on tenderhooks waiting to know if our good friend Yeroen Stoltz got back to us about NASA's warp drive propulsion system that we wanted to discuss, but the URL he sent to us didn't work, well, he's got back in touch and says, Hi, Martians and Jen. Listening to the December show, I was very surprised to suddenly hear my name. See, if people email and tweet us, we do use it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Regarding mm. the new in-space propulsion system, sorry the link didn't work. It was actually the same thing as the helical drive, which we've already covered uh, to be in violation of physics as we know it. For some reason, it was named differently. Probably why the link also doesn't work anymore. So no warp drives and endless possibilities. No, oh, sad. Uh, regarding my name, the O-E in Dutch is pronounced as oo is in English. So uh, uh, snooze, booze, moon, etc. All the best cool. from the Netherlands. Now, of course, that begs the next question of then how do we pronounce your surname? Is it Stolt or Stolter or Stolter? Or how? So yeah. th- 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 that's still hanging. Basically, just phonetically write your names out to us because we haven't got a bloody <laughs> yeah. clue. Just write if your name. If you're one of those foreign then, like, types, just yeah. anyone. Because I can't pronounce words for shit. <laughs> I think in these in these uh, in these Brexit times, we, oh, we, we go we're again. going we're going to we're going to no uh, we're going to we're going to shout loudly and, and make everyone speak English. You shall speak English, or you shall not speak at all, <laughs> sir. Yes, you will not be read out. <laughs> Definitely edit that out. 
<laughs> That's definitely going in. Oh, my God, it's going to get so much backlash from it. Nah. We are mocking ourselves. All right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Right then, so it's time to hear all about that newsy goodness out there, and we're starting with Jenny. I'm watching you still. All right. (laughs) I will be frank, I've got more stories this time, but most of them are really small. No, no, most of them are really small. All right? Uh, You didn't believe me last episode, and it all turned out very well, didn't it? So. Well, well, you're wittering now, get on with it. (laughs) (laughs) So. Starting the space news off this month with a series of record-breaking feats. First up, we have astronaut Christina Cook, who has set a new record for the longest single space mission by a woman during her current stay aboard the ISS. The -hmm. previous record was set by Peggy Whitson in 2017, which was 289 days, 5 hours and 1 minute. Now, Cook will exceed this duration by a staggering six weeks. So she is Whoa. smashing that record. Wow, that's Whoa, not just that, beating it a bit, is that isn't getting it? on for a year then? Yeah, it is, because she's expected to return to Earth on the 6th of February, and she arrived on the 14th of March the previous year. Oh, she must be gutted. I mean, an extra month, and she's got a year in. I know. So if she returns on time, because it's a big if, I mean, maybe they'll extend her mission even longer... Um, but she'll be just shy of the longest single space flight set by a NASA astronaut, right? It currently stands at 340 days and was set by Scott Kelly. I bet he felt like Jelly Kelly when he landed. He must have... Yeah. The bone atrophy must have been phenomenal after that time. And I imagine it will be for Christina Cook as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly, yeah. Um, but it does give researchers a really rare opportunity to examine yeah. what the effect on the body is of living in microgravity for an extended period. Yeah. Um, and this sort of research is really vital for extended lunar missions and, critically, missions mm. to Mars. Because they're going to have to do 18 months. Yeah, because they've got to get there and then they've got to get back. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, roughly speaking. Um, yeah. But in order to beat the overall longest space flight record that record is currently held by cosmonaut valerie polyakov who spent 438 days so that's roughly a year and two months aboard mia in the 90s and that was a fire hazard yeah and that was 30 years ago you know ish we're, we're going on for but yeah well done to cook next new record uh we're going to the moon and this one is again another feat of endurance. China's lunar rover U-22 has broken the record for active work on the surface of the moon. U-22 is part of the Chang'e 4 mission and has been working on the lunar surface for over 11 months, beating the previous record set in 1971. Oh. 1971. Uh, set by a Soviet Union uh, rover called Lunokhod 1. Um, and that record was 10 and a half months. And U-22 has been exploring the lunar South Pole region, um, but on the far side of the moon. And finally, in terms of records, it's time to celebrate another country joining the exclusive club of spacefaring nations. Ethiopia have sent their first satellite into space aboard a Chinese Long March 4B rocket. And the main payload of the rocket was a Chinese-Brazilian remote sensing satellite designed to monitor the Earth, um, particularly the Amazon rainforest. And Ethiopia's first satellite is also a remote sensing one and is designed to help the country monitor climate change effects and weather phenomena related to agriculture and forestry. Uh, also help them monitor their natural resources and use them efficiently. Ethiopia is only the 10th African country to have a satellite in space. And so we congratulate them on their amazing achievement. Brilliant. Talking of launches, we can't forget to mention ESA's Kops or Cheeps. I mean, I've been to conferences and they've called it Kops, but really, yes. Oh. I would have said Cheops. Yeah, I would too. Kops, yeah, Cheops, Cheeps, yeah. whatever. Um, it was recently launched from um, French Guiana aboard a Soyuz rocket. Um, Cheeps, Kops, Kops. 
is an exoplanet characterising mission. Uh, so its job is not to find planets, but to tell us more about the planets that we already know exist. It's going to study transiting exoplanets around bright nearby stars, for which their mass is already known from spectroscopic surveys, enabling us to figure out their density. And it's also going to give us some information on planetary atmospheres. Now, Ooh. I'm really looking forward to that one. I think yeah. that one's going to be really exciting, oh, especially yeah. what it's going to because this is going to find the candidates for James Webb and for uh, Next Generation ESO Telescope. You know, the, to be able to learn more about these planets that we might be able to find the biosignatures of life in the atmospheres of. Mm. This is just this is that next level. I'm so yeah. excited by Cheops. Yeah, good. this is going to be this is going to be another of those ESO missions that works away quietly in the background yep. and reveals so much. It's yeah. a it's a Gaia type thing but for exoplanets yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's going to yeah. be awesome. Yeah. I'm ending on quite a divisive note with the official creation of Space Force. Grim Space Grim Force! Mm. Trump recently signed the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act for the United States and that means Space Force is now officially the sixth branch of the American Armed Forces. Uh, what does that mean, though? Well, it's anyone's guess, to be honest. Is it going to be new satellites armed with lasers to shoot down <laughs> enemy targets? Nuclear weapons in space? Spy equipment? Who knows? Um, either way, I think the next year is going to be interesting in terms of Space Force because we're actually going to figure out what it's all going to entail, this um, militarization of space. Mm. But the typical thing is, it means that every country now that's got some money is going to have to have their own space force mm. so that they've got some kind of parity. So the UK is yep. going to have its own space force in five or ten years' time, and I'm too oh, old. UK, and... No, UK's UK's already UK's already announced this. Oh, have they? Yeah, uh, the UK is standing up 23 Squadron in the Royal Air Force as its official space squadron. Oh God! So it's already already it's been begun. been announced. Number 23 squadron will be the RAF in space. And they're going to bring together all the, the kind of space activities of the British Armed Forces and do and, and do more. Uh, that's all right, though. I need a job. France has already announced its um, its space force. Um, La, La Space Force, no. I think it's called. Yeah. <laughs> no. La Force Space. La Force <laughs> Space. <laughs> <laughs> um, they announced that oh, back in the autumn um, and they were already talking about laser armed satellites and things like that oh so when um, I was saying lasers I, and I was yeah, yeah, you about you with a, far, you know, no, they actually at the announcement the French had a model of a, a satellite that they are already under development which has a, an energy weapon pew, pew. lasers already attached to it and there's me pissing about with Austin Powers references yeah, yeah no no it's all it's all kicking off um the it was said. Someone said the other day. I can't remember who said that. Really, it should be uh, not space force, but space core, um, in terms of kind of it's in terms of its authorization and it's how it's kind of where it sits in the U.S. military sphere. It's like the U.S. Marine Corps hmm. in that well, it's related to another force in that it's mostly air force, but it's a, it's kind of like a separate force within a within a force. Mm. So while the U.S. Marine Corps is technically a separate armed force, it's kind of part of the US Navy mm. um, this is the same in that this is kind of part of the Air Force um, but it is a separate unit so it really should be the Space Corps here's to Space Force Grim Gafford <laughs> right then Ralph Yes. Bring us bring us back to, to happier times. Yes, yeah, so first up is the imminent graduation of the latest intake, or NASA's 22nd group of astronauts. Can you believe there's wow. 22 of them now? That's amazing. I know. That is incredible, actually. Or, um, or, and also not, because we've been in space since 1961. Well, there is that. You know, mm. the original seven, now we're on the 22nd group. Um, and this lot uh, graduate basic training on the, on the 10th of January, which is as we released this is probably a few days ago and they'll go straight into competing like motherfuckers throwing their comrades under the bus uh any way they can to get ahead in the race for mission assignments and there are two things that stand out to me here firstly they'll not only be available for crew assignments to the international space station but also missions to the moon under the artemis program mm. or as some of them are still young enough perhaps even mars in the 2030s so these may well be um, the, the lunar really well known names mm. kind of like you know your Buzz Aldrin's and your Gene Cernan's uh, of the future 
or maybe even more famous if one of these goes on to become the first person to step on Mars. May even be more famous than Neil Armstrong. And then secondly, it's also interesting for young people listening to the show with hopes of becoming astronauts to see that the age requirement and skills for deep space exploration are still the same as they were for the shuttle and the International Space Station era because apart from um, Buzz Aldrin, who had a PhD in orbital rendezvous, and uh, Jack Schmidt, who was a geologist, the Mercury, Gemini and Apollo astronauts were former test pilots, almost without exception. Um, but in this newest group of 13, five were test pilots with engineering master's degrees and one was a US Navy SEAL with a degree in maths and a doctorate in medicine. And that's the, the key thing here. It seems that the engineering or the science skills that people have are what's important so if anybody is looking at becoming an astronaut in the future it really is so important to have those at least two degrees in in different uh, science fields but those that do have science backgrounds and non-military backgrounds we have an assistant professor of aeronautics and astronautics from mit a researcher in microorganisms in subsurface environments ranging from caves to deep sea sediments holding a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's in marine sciences exobiology anybody for when we go to Mars Mm. there's a research engineer at an oceanographic institute working on the engineering tests and operations of deep ocean research submersibles and robots has a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering and a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics a postdoctoral fellow at the California Institute of Technology working on NASA's Curiosity rover with a bachelor's degree in geology and environmental sciences and doctorate in geology and an assistant professor in combustion in the Department of Engineering at Cambridge conducting research on flame propagation in microgravity, holding a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a doctorate in engineering. And I'm just <laughs> laughing there because I think we, we made a, a, I made a slight reference earlier to Michael Foles' doomed expedition to the Mir uh, space station as it was then when uh, flame propagation was a hell of a problem um, back then. <laughs> but, but all in... To be fair, to be fair, that was a collision. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but but fire in space in microgravity is uh, is quite the hazard. <laughs> it's a bit of a bugger. Yeah, you don't want to fire when you're when you're two months out from Earth on a six month trip to Mars. Mm. Um, so all in all, you've got eleven Americans and two Canadians, seven men, six are women, and they were chosen from a record setting pool of more than eighteen thousand applicants. And, wow, uh, 18,000. 18,000. 18, and that's what the competition is. You know, now, n- even though you don't have to be a test pilot anymore necessarily to become an astronaut, you're still competing with ever more people round on round. So the more degrees mm. you've got, the more experience you've got is just going to be critical. And I think medicine is what I would suggest is probably going to be the thing that is going to be so important that you are at least a doctor, yeah. uh, a medical doctor for when the shit hits the fan medically uh, on long duration yeah. oh. missions and yeah they'll then definitely they want else. a doctor going to Mars they were yeah I mean the guys who are up on the ISS now are trained at kind of the level of paramedics and things hmm. to go to the moon for long duration yeah. we're going to be looking at you know kind of if not doctors at least sort of nurse practitioner kind of level well what we're seeing here is we've got people here that are doctors medical doctors but they also have masters in engineering or astronautics or geology i mean we've got here a guy that is a navy seal yeah. and a medical doctor yeah <laughs> and a test pilot absolutely incredible <laughs> uh, these people make you sick frankly <laughs> they do they really yeah. do <laughs> i i i feel utterly inadequate yeah. i feel utterly <laughs> inadequate as a human being i i am I am of a different species. I think. Yeah, Na- NASA think that they're inspiring us. No, they're just making us feel very insignificant. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. And then the uh, the next story I've got, or the last story I've got, is um, regarding the Osiris Rex mission, which is. Mm. NASA's Origins Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer Osiris Rex, which I can already hear Paul throwing up into his own mouth. I, at that I, I am, I am actually like stabbing myself. What's to, wrong with that? It starts with the all the letters. Oh, it's a no. It's a. It's the way that academics <sighs> cobble these acronyms together, and it's just, it's like shoehorning a fat woman into stilettos. Uh, oh god but what i was to say is it makes them sound like smart asses do you know how this process works that's what the general public dislike about scientists but do you know how the process works of coming up with an acronym 
Why does it have to be an acronym? Why can't it just be a name? Curiosity just... wasn't a bad name for a mission. Rosetta wasn't no. a bad name for a mission. Just, just come up with a name. Don't have to give it this friggin' I'm a smart ass. I can get all the words of the thing into a slightly but that convoluted is word. Exactly what academia is like. It's any opportunity. I to know, show and how they should stop it. Smart ass, you are. They, they should, should stop, stop it immediately. This is why the general public don't like scientists. Yes. Because they sound like smart asses. Yeah. But they And they're not helping themselves. And as Michael Gove yeah. told us, we've had enough of experts. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Yes. So this this spacecraft, if you've not been paying attention, um, has been orbiting a two thousand pound asteroid called Bennu in the asteroid belt for just over a year now. So it's been taking images it's been and mapping long. the asteroid. Is that all, did you say? Is it been that that long? A year now? It has. It's been there since wow. last December, so just over a year as wow. we're releasing this. Wow. Um, and it's been mapping the surface from a mile above the surface. Um, the main reason for that is to look for a contact site so that it can collect a 60-gram sample to return to Earth for analysis. So cool. Um, and it, it, oh, the way that it's going to do it is just phenomenal. But it had a list of four candidate sites, which I think is quite beautifully named. They've, they've called them Sandpiper, Osprey, Kingfisher and Nightingale. It almost Aww. sounds That's Darwinian. Unlike. It's like the age of botany, isn't it? That I like. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. People like that. Yeah. And the considerations they had for the site were mostly based around trying to identify somewhere that would yield the best science returns, but also be safe. You know, they mm. want to make sure they've got a smoothish region reducing the risk of collisions or boulders that might damage the spacecraft. And they've decided mm. on the Nightingale site, which is in a northern crater 230 feet wide. And the images show that the regolith, that fine-grained surface material, is dark and the crater is relatively smooth in that region. Now, the crater's thought to be quite young with freshly exposed regolith, meaning that the site should provide a pristine and well-preserved sample of the asteroid, giving the best possible insight into Bennu and the solar system, uh, the history of the solar mm. system. So... Sometime this year, Cyrus Rex will get low enough to make contact with the surface of Bennu. And the point of contact uh, is going to be this long extended boom uh, with a sophisticated sample collector on the end. So it's not going to be a lander like. I just love how they're literally going up to it and poking it with a stick to see what happens. Yeah. Almost like literally. They are. So there's no lander. There's no. Um, what was that? anthropomorphized robot that Rosetta had I've forgotten now Philae there's no Philae on this they're not sending down a lander oh no mm. they're going to just side look to the, the asteroid with the entire spacecraft that they're going to have to get back to Earth as well and um, and just touch the surface um, so mm. when, when contact's made with this extended boom it'll puff a burst of nitrogen to blow two centimetre regolith particles up into the sample collector and it's got this five-second timer that will make sure that it limits the collection time to reduce the chance of a collision. And after the timer expires, it'll then perform this back-away manoeuvre to send it back up safely away from Bennu and then return it to Earth for analysis in September 2024. Oh, that is amazing. So cool. That's amazing. That's going to be fascinating. Uh, do you know what? It, it's the, the two things occurred to me there. One, when Philae landed on... Um, Churyumov Grasimenko? That's the one. It found the surface was rock hard. Yes. It broke the hammer. Do you remember it broke the hammer? So there, there's a little bit we wonder if they're going to go up to it and actually not be able to scrape any material, and it's just going <laughs> to. Hopefully, there's enough regolith, but yeah, yeah. snap the arm off. Yeah. Well, the other well, one, they are mapping it from a mile up, so you mm. know, hopefully, they should have seen that there's enough regolith there that it's worthwhile doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure they. Um, and the other one, September 2024. Oh, if if anything sticks to plan, it's gonna it's gonna be completely overshadowed by what else is going oh on in, God, in the world of NASA yeah. at that point. Yeah. <laughs> well, I re I remember when Hayabusa, I think it was Hayabusa. The the oh no, it might have been Stardust. I've forgotten what the mission was called. There was one where they had this like aerogel collector from um from an asteroid or a comet, and that was the first sample that was sent back down to Earth. And and when it landed, there was there was issues over contamination and i remember this being kind of one of the first things i was reading about when i first accessed the internet back in something like mm. 1996 and it was like whoa the internet tells you about space <laughs> <laughs> mm -mm. 
This was when uh, Clive James, dearly departed, recently departed Clive James, was referring to it as the information superhighway that was coming our way. <laughs> My God, I feel old again. I'm never going to be an astronaut. Oh, I already missed Clive James. And now we look at videos of cats. <laughs> and use it to undermine democracy, but enough of that. Yeah. Right then, so, there we go. We're having a little big, biggie discussion. Of course, it's about the one that's on everybody's um, mind at the moment, which is commercial space flight. Mm. Yes. Can you believe that we've ignored the advances in commercial space flight and Artemis in all of our stories? We have. We have. Hmm? Well, I, I think we said a little while ago we're going to give Artemis a little break, aren't we? For a yeah, because we did go on about that. it for a while. A lot. <laughs> There's a, it's kind of I feel like Artemis is a, there's so much going on but it's kind of all happening and there's almost no, nothing to report as yet oh there will be oh, this year oh there, there will be will be yeah. lots there will be lots and I have a feeling it will be the, the kind of main news story for almost yeah. every episode as we get to especially towards the middle of the year yeah but I think at the moment it's quite nice to have a little break from it just, just let them <laughs> kind of create the news before we deliver it I think yeah. that um, otherwise we're just speculating to go, to go back to our cookery roots pop it in the oven at 180 degrees and uh, and just let it let it let it bake are you saying it's oven ready because that's just going to make me angry <laughs> <laughs> that won't mean anything to the Americans <laughs> that won't mean anything to Americans but uh, anyway moving on moving on um, Starliner we all watched it I think that was an interesting test, wasn't it? Mm. It was, and I've got to say, I was a little bit disappointed, looking back at that in retrospect, at how all the attention was on um, the failure, which was basically a timer issue. Um, and I'm, mm. <laughs> I'm expecting that this is probably someone really red-faced at Boeing that, that screwed up on the on the software or or the programming. There was a timer issue that made the spacecraft, after it separated from the Atlas V rocket, think that it was 11 hours ahead or, ele- yeah, 11 hours ahead. So it went into a deorbit yeah, yeah. burn, um, which basically meant that it couldn't go to the International Space Station like it was planned to do. But everything else worked absolutely flawlessly. The man-rated Atlas V worked flawlessly. Um, a lot of the uh, systems tests that they were doing in space and the communications tests worked absolutely flawlessly. And it landed perfectly. Yeah, which is the first US capsule to land on land using airbags and uh, and rockets mm. to decelerate it to make sure that it's... Um, oh, no, it's not using rockets, is it? It's just airbags and parachutes, I think. But it's, it landed in New Mexico in the White Sands, um, which is the first time that's ever happened. So you don't have your expensive ships uh, fishing it out of the ocean. Yeah. But everything yeah. worked absolutely flawlessly apart from that it, that it wasn't able to dock with the International Space Station um, because of a, a software issue. Um, it tested out um, human su- um, life support systems. So we know that it is okay for people to fly in now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really was a phenomenal test, which means that there is now an American capsule that is ready for people to fly on board next time round. Yeah, they say the, the 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 feedback over over the sort of Christmas period is actually essentially NASA was actually pretty happy with it, and that they were pretty satisfied that it mm. wasn't a um, a kind of engineering failure or, or a, a system failure that that was kind of unmanageable it was actually it was just a cock up yeah yeah a, a minor cock up that, that had huge implications but yeah the, but i oh, think but, the pr it, disaster is bigger than the actual disaster itself yeah, it's yeah. not it's not that much of a disaster no i think i think in, in terms of the pr they, they were hoping you know, the capsule was going to go to the iss and it's going to be fantastic and, and then that was the massive disaster for them but actually the capsule worked absolutely fine mm. other than some dingbat put the wrong time in. But it also proves that they can cope if something goes wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and actually, uh, there's a few people have speculated, I don't know if this is official or not, that had there been a crew on board, they would have resolved it. Oh, really? Like a manual so it, override? It, the, in the same way, like, you know, Apollo 12 with the, the restart yeah. and all the rest of it, that if you'd actually had some human fingers on board yeah. pushing buttons, they actually could have just re- resolved it huh. on, on flight. So actually, it wouldn't have even been an abort. Yeah. Um, though if it had been abort, it looks like it would have been a perfectly safe abort, and they would have landed perfectly safely, and it would all been fine. Yeah. yeah. So. And it's really important as well to test that their sort of fail safes do work, and clearly they yeah. have, because it, yeah. it went a bit wrong. But 
okay, they didn't get to the target, but they achieved all their other goals and they got the capsule yeah. back. So, And not only have they got the capsule back, but that is now going to be refurbished to be sent up again. So um, Sunita Williams, uh, NASA astronaut, has already christened the ship Calypso after Jack Costo's ship, and she's hey. expected to uh, crew that in the second manned flight, uh, Orion flight. Sorry, not Orion. <laughs> Mixed up with spacecraft, a Boeing Starliner flight uh in late 2020 there's going to be a, a crude test flight scheduled for early 2020 whether that one will actually go given this setback we don't know but they are that is still the the timeline there'll be a crude test flight and then a, a full operational mission late 2020 mm. so yeah so where where are we then with with um crude test flights you know the 2020 because actually this this year looks like it's lining up to be quite a busy we're going from no no crude launches from America to potentially a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this is kind of like it's a bit like the situation where uh, Kennedy set the ball rolling in the 1960s, and I'm I'm not doing this as a political thing. It's just it's just purely the facts of it that in the early 1960s, Kennedy set the mission to go to the moon, and it already went through Lyndon Johnson, and then um, it was Richard Nixon that had mm-hmm. the historic phone call with the astronauts on the moon and it's the same now that what we I think at the time we all we all kind of knew it was a sensible thing to do but it was so underwhelming when Obama cancelled the Constellation program uh, Bush's program to go to the moon and Mars and in favour of priming commercial spacecraft and, and not just you know the usual defense primes that do this the lockheed martins and the boeings but also the smaller companies so that's mm-hmm, why we mm-hmm. have this really diverse field and thankfully this administration has kept that going and they're going to be that that safety net that fail safe that if the really expensive as you, as you mentioned in the last show paul the really expensive orion that's something like 80 million uh, a capsule or is it a seat i can't remember so much money um, you've got SpaceX that in the first quarter, uh, spring 2020, are going to be doing a crude test flight with two astronauts for two weeks. You've mm-hmm. got Orion, um, Artemis 1 will be the uncrewed flight to the moon in November 2020, um, being followed up by Artemis 2 uh, on the Orion capsule, which is scheduled to be a crewed lunar orbital mission in late 2022. Blue Origin have got their... Um, first crewed test flight expected in 2020, but there's a bit more vagueness around that. That may end up just being a fee-paying suborbital trip into space. Um, but they've certainly got all the hardware um, at Blue Origin, the rockets and the capsules, and now they're working on a lunar lander too. Mm. Then Sierra Nevada, which I think is your your favourite of the pick, Paul. Um, oh, I love it. They're, they, they, they've they described themselves as being laser-focused on cargo missions to the International Space mm-hmm, Station. Mm-hmm. And since they missed out on one of the rounds of NASA funding for commercial crew, um, there's no actual crew version likely anytime soon, despite it being in their plans for the future. So that might be one kind of post-ISS when that gets deorbited and, you know, we're talking past two, uh, 2024 uh, there may well be a crude version because I think they said that there's something like 85% of uh, a, a cargo uh, vehicle for the International Space Station 85% of that is um, work that's needed for, for crewed flights as well so it just needs a bit of extra work on that but you know there's a lot of competition there there's a lot of backups there it's not just the Orion you've got Boeing you've got um, Blue Origin and SpaceX yep. that are really um, coming up behind them and, and Sierra Nevada is the next generation of sexy shuttles it's very cool it's very cool it, it is we, we, we're going from from famine to, to feast yeah. very quickly and this we? year is going to be so exciting in space flight in human yeah. space flight I, I, it is I think it's um, it's that year that if, if if it keeps the target 2024 it's that I mean it's almost like the run up to the Apollo missions again but I wasn't alive for those, uh, and that's exactly how I feel. That you know, yeah. for us, this is this, this is, is our, our Apollo, Apollo time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And as soon as they start going anywhere near the vicinity of the moon, that's when it's all really going to be hitting the headlines and catching yeah. the newspapers and and stuff like that. Yeah, and as I keep saying, 
when they go back this time, they're going to be doing it in H, uh, 8K HD. You know, it's oh, the, yeah, the it's imagery is going to be phenomenal. And, oh. of course, they've got the capability to, every time they go there, they're going to be able to send a whole load of CubeSats and, and just do so, get so much science gathering yeah. every time mm-hmm. they fling anything mm-hmm. out to the moon. Because why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't yeah. you also do that? Just think of the oh. technology advances. It's going to be exactly like, have you seen that film... Is it First Man, the one with Ryan Gosling, and it's like mm. the the remake yeah. of it's like the the documentary film about Apollo Eleven, and um, if you notice the until they get to the moon, it's all slightly grainy and like degraded, but then as soon mm-hmm, as they mm-hmm. get to the moon, it's full HD. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. No, it, it, it's it's yeah. I think uh, hopefully it's a bright future. Right then, it's time for our question and answers and we have a question, a great question from our good friend. Well, it's Gavin. We Gavla. put out a call for Yeah, Gavla. Gavin and we we put out a, a request for some questions and he got in there quickly with I thought a great one for for the space one. There are lots of other questions by the way and we have made a note of them all. Yes, we have. We've written really... them all down and we are going to get through them. But this one's from Gavin at Pillars Creatio. And he said, why is it falling to ESA, the European Space Agency, to send life-detecting experiments to Mars, Rosalind Franklin Rover? How come NASA doesn't tackle this head-on, i.e. searching for signs of life rather than life? Mm. The last time they sent life experiments was with Viking landers in the 70s. Mm. So. <sighs> There's two answers to this, really. Yeah. Uh. No, actually, there's there's lots of lots there's, of there's actually to this. loads of answers. Yeah, there is. I mean, the main thing is that NASA want to to spin it out into lots of. It, it sounds so contrary, but NASA want to spin it out into lots of incremental things because one, their big focus is being able to do what they can with the technology to make sure it's a success each time, rather than having lots of failures. And when you go to Mars. You just have to look at the litany of failures that there's yeah. been with the Russians and the Europeans and British with Beagle. Mm. Um, that technology has now got to the point. I mean, you look at the success they had with the Sky Crane when they landed the Curiosity rover, and I think, although they were optimistic, it blew them away just how successful that was that you could put such a payload down on the surface. Yeah. And su- unsurprisingly, the very next mission, they're looking for life in Mars twenty with the Mars twenty twenty mm-hmm. rover using mm-hmm. a sky crane. But it's they also had their fingers burnt a little bit by really pushing the boundaries when it came to Viking. Mm. Um, and they had they 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 tried this in the uh, must have been the late seventies yeah, when 70s. they landed a Viking on the uh, one of the Viking um, landers on the surface that probed down, looked for life, and they thought they'd found it. And then there was questions around contamination, and it still was quite unsettled. And that was really pushing the envelope. So ever since then, NASA has always looked to what can we do incrementally to do it in a a way that, in a way, you would say it's more of a European way that is less showy to incrementally improve the science improve the body of knowledge and also improve the technology as they're doing this and because in a way this is america's form of socialism a way of being able to seed universities way of being able to seed companies to be able to deliver things uh, new capabilities that's boosting the ability the technical ability of america that can be transferred into military sector and can be transferred into commercial sectors and industrial sectors and at the same time learn more about the universe that we live in but they're all incrementally advancing the science in that area to the point now where we're finding ourselves in that dead heat actually where you've got america and europe both sending a rover different designs but looking specifically well, for life well in mars 2020 i mean it's it's still but it's not looking for microbes directly it's still yeah it, it's looking for the signatures and it's looking for more the possibilities of the the kind of ancient life signatures and and the, the kind of it it possibly will find it if it's there still 
But actually, the where the Rosalind Franklin is actually really focused on finding life now. And that's that's more of what what certainly from the European mm. bias we would consider to be more of a an American concept mm. that sod doing the 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 incremental scientific groundwork. Mm. Get out there, look for life, go and find life. And if life's not there in that in that region that that can traverse and and drill down, then that just leaves you kind of scratching your head and going, right, what else can we scrape out of this mission Yeah, that's going to be useful? I, you know, it's it's almost a balls-out attempt. Let's go and find life. And, you know, if you if you landed in the Mojave Desert and drilled down or if you landed in Antarctica, you'd struggle to find life unless you were in the right spot. Yeah, I think I think it's also um, a, it, it's an economic thing, isn't it, that basically Europe's got one shot at this. One shot in a in a generation, yeah. Yeah, this is it. Whereas, whereas, I mean, NASA will know, do one every ten years. <laughs> Na- NASA, well, NASA, NASA do a do a, a Mars shot every uh, every uh, Mars apparition. Yeah, every time yeah, Mars they gets into position, yeah. they the, of late they you know they basically fire a, a mission at, at, at Mars. Whereas ESA, you know, in terms of a big lander, a rover, this is it. You know, this is this is Europe's big shot at this. Mm. Um, so I think they've gone with the idea. Well, we might as well just go for the big one. Yeah. And do that science. I mean, it's going to do other science, but it, it is interesting how Europe has zeroed in on the. Well, let's just let's just do it. I mean, I think from British perspective, it's a it's a it's, it's a British led mission. This rover, we do have that kind of biological focus in this country. You know, biological sciences are. are yeah, well, we had it with Beagle. Exactly, and you know, there's there's. It, it's a it's a heritage, isn't it? Because it was called Beagle because of Darwin. Yeah. So there there is a I think a bit of it. That's the emphasis that comes out of this country, um, and and by default in this case Europe. That well we're going to look for life because you know it, it's an area we're particularly interested in. We look directly. Uh, whereas Americans have, have because they can afford it as well. They've done that as you say that incremental thing of of, of building the picture. And I think uh, there's, you know, will it find life? I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be very, very interesting um, couple of years when these land. It is. <laughs> when one lands and one crashes. <laughs> oh, don't. Don't say that. Don't say that. I've got I've got an interview lined up with, with someone who's involved in it all. Mm. about. So that, that's, that's, fingers crossed, we're going to get the bit of a lowdown from yeah. Airbus. I think we'll so. have a little bit of spin about Russian landers being just as good as American sky cranes. No, they're not. <laughs> that's not. That's not. <laughs> well, like a Boeing capsule test, this show is really over far too quickly. But it's time to deploy the parachute and put this baby down. I asked last time. I don't think I'm going to bother asking again, but please leave us a review. <laughs> I mean, we ask every time at the end of the episode and no burger ever seems to listen to us. Just log on, give us a rating and say, I like this with a with a D and then a, a <laughs> thumbs up emoji and then a smiley emoji. And then we'll be happy because, you know, <laughs> we don't make any money off this. We do it for the love. So please give us some love. I've got a feeling that once we get to the end of the Q&A section, people don't even bother listening to the outro. But if you are still listening, then you you really are the people that we like the most. And do email us at the show at awesomeastronomy.com to let us know what you like or you don't like in the show so that you can make this your own. You can make it evolve into a way that you like. And the more people that tell us what they want, the more likely we are to make it the way you want it. Or you can tweet us at Awesome Astropod with your thoughts to read out on the show. Give us your suggestions or questions that you want answering. So, until next time, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. 
If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>